Um, what I'd love to do is get started with our first session. Now, um, as Jonathan said, the event is meant to be highly collaborative. And as we get to upgrades and the other sessions throughout the week, we're going to have things will become more roundtable style, be more opportunities to for people to unmute and, and join the conversation. But for this first session, we're going to do it a little differently in that, you know, everything we do with open source is for the users. We fight for the users. That's that's our true north. So to kind of give us some context before we dive into each of those topics, we want to actually hear from three amazing users. These users are going to tell us a little bit about the day in the life of, of a user trying to run massive scale for, for these critical operations for their business or their research efforts or whoever they serve um, for uh, with open source. So we're going to hear presentations for this section. We'll have about five minutes of Q&A after each user. And we're going to do that Q&A through chat, the text chat. So if you can put your questions in the text chat. I will read out a few of them during that five minute section after each user speaks with their slides. And then the rest of the week is not really gonna be about presentations and slides, it's gonna be more round table style. But we thought since all of the work we do together collaboratively uh, as people, as Jonathan says, uh, would you know is, is about how do you actually run it in production by hearing from users that are running this stuff in production, what challenges they're having That'll help kind of frame our thinking as we head into the week, talking about upgrades and, and all the other issues that we're gonna dive into. So to, uh, to kick us off, um, the first user is from a company called Blizzard, you may have heard of, and they have some incredible, uh, I would say very mission critical infrastructure that the world is relying on more than ever now that we're all at home. So to present and tell us about their use case and some of the challenges they've had scaling, I've got uh, Colin and Eric from Blizzard. Take it away. Good morning. Hi, Mark. Morning. Uh, are we able to? Yeah, we should be able to make you a uh, co-host so you can co -host. screen share. Excellent. Yeah, once you're a co-host, you should be able to uh, take over the screen share. And um, I believe that we're pointing and clicking as we speak. Excellent. So uh, while we do that, <laughs> let me see, uh, tell you a couple other things. You know, we're, we're going to have, uh, after uh, Blizzard, we're going to be hearing from Open Infra Labs, which is, I don't want to steal their thunder, but an amazing collaboration. And, um, you know, we're also going to be hearing from Verizon, which is one of the largest uh, mobile carriers in the world. And uh, they're talking about some of their testing work. Um, so... Are we? Uh, I'm just like, waiting, still waiting here <laughs> to. I've I've got things ready to go this end. Okay. And as I'm co-host, I'll get us started. Okay. Yeah, it looks like uh, we might be uh, having an issue with the co-host uh, feature. <laughs> oh, so okay. we may have to we may have to call an audible here. Let, here um, we go. It's okay. It's I uh, okay. just got it now. Let me... All right. Awesome. Working through the, the kinks. Okay. Let's hear about uh, Blizzard. All right. Can everyone see this? Okay. Is that yes. showing up, Mark? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting, yeah, we're getting it, about two slides. Swap, swap your screens. Swap the screens. <laughs> yeah. You bet. Yeah, it looks like we're seeing uh, the, so the... Go to... Good go shot. To the yeah. 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 Uh, one second. Where it says swap displays. Third button over on the top left. There you go. Thank Beth you. Beth is already diving in and helping. There she goes. Awesome. You'll get to meet Beth very soon. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. We're uh, we're connecting here at six thirty a.m. from what would be a sunny California. Sunny California. Uh, so, just to do quick intros, my name is Colin Cashin. I run cloud engineering at Blizzard Entertainment. I'm also joined by Eric Anderson here, who leads one of our cloud engineering teams focused on OpenStack. So I'll present today, but uh, Eric will keep me honest during the Q&A as he and his team are the true experts in the technology. For anyone who doesn't know, Blizzard Entertainment is a developer and publisher of entertainment software with some of the world's most beloved game franchises, including World of Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo, Hearthstone, and Overwatch. And we are dedicated to creating the most epic entertainment experiences ever. All right, here we go. 
So just to give people a quick overview of cloud and multi-cloud at Blizzard. So our cloud powers all of these entertainment experiences and our strategy is multi-cloud. So we operate private cloud and we consume multiple public cloud providers, including Amazon, Google, and Alibaba. We own and operate an extensive global private cloud platform built on OpenStack. This involves over 12,000 compute nodes across 13 co-location facilities in the four regions we operate our games in, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Our deployment is somewhat unique in that we operate a single production deployment globally, with globally replicated instances of Glance and Swift and pseudo-replicated Keystone. After a period of development and staging, which begun around 2012, 2013, our private cloud went into production in 2016, ahead of the global launch of Overwatch. Since then, we have integrated 13 projects into our cloud, providing for all the common infrastructure primitives that our game and platform teams use to deploy applications and store data. In general, we value simplicity over complexity. So much of our cloud is simple. For example, we use Linux Bridge for networking over SDN driver. In Q4 of last year, we completed an upgrade project to get to Rocky release across all our environments. This was a huge undertaking as we moved five releases in one jump. That's Mataka to Rocky. I think most people appreciate the magnitude of that. So we continue to contribute upstream and we're intimately involved in the Designate and Sanlam projects. Eric Anderson drove a major cleanup of Designate and Duck Chu Wang was a PTL and a core reviewer for Sanlan, helping drive the reliability and scalability of that service. Uh, Blizzard gave a talk at the uh, Denver Summit last year, so if folks want to have a take a look at that, we uh, highly encourage it. Uh, in supporting a large scale and heavily distributed cloud, we've, we've hit many issues around scale. And today we're going to talk briefly about four that are nearest and dearest to our hearts. Scaling challenge number one, so Nova scheduling with Numa pinning. In order to guarantee compute performance for our high performance game server workloads, in particular Overwatch as a first person shooter, the decision was made in 2016 to implement Numa pinning during scheduling as we use multi-socket systems. This ensures that guest VMs are not scheduled across Numa zones, exposing memory bandwidth bottlenecking for computational heavy workloads, ensuring that the penalty of crossing oversubscribed bus interconnects on the silicon die are avoided. Overall, this caused a lot of pain at scale. Numa scheduling is expensive and it requires a, a read call to NovaDB. It's all impacting the turnaround timeliness of the process. During large deployments, where teams may deploy hundreds of instances simultaneously, we regularly ran into race conditions whereby scheduling would fail as the same small set of computes were targeted and the scheduler trod on itself. This was tackled by some configuration tuning whereby the target pool for the scheduler was increased from one to 20 computes. For each new request to the scheduler, it would randomly pick one. Another side effect of NUMA pinning over the last few years was broken live migrations, now fixed in trains and over release. Operationally, this affected our ability to, dr to drain compute nodes during maintenance events, and often we have to do this at scale. The takeaway here is that for large environments, NUMA pinning should be implemented in a tested and controlled manner, and that live migrations with NUMA profiling is fixed in new releases. Scaling challenge number two, scaling RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is the advanced message queuing protocol compliant message broker used to exchange messages and act as a broker between OpenStack components. The biggest challenges with Rabbit at scale are recovering when something goes wrong. With a large scale infrastructure event, for example, a transient data center network outage, Rabbit can be overwhelmed with connections and messages. To tackle this, Blizzard tuned Rabbit configurations to introduce extended connection timeouts with a variance to allow for a slower but graceful recovery. Additional tuning was applied to Rabbit queues with policies to ensure that only critical queues are replicated across the cluster and that queues cannot grow exponentially during these events. We consider anything that is a one shot message to be critical. So a VM creator VM delete event is handled by the compute queues and it's not an RPC call. So these are always replicated. For fire and forget messages, some notifications are critical and we have a very high limit, for example, DNS, but others such as inventory notifications, a very low limit since inventory has support for polling and will cover even if a message is lost. Takeaway here is that Rabbit needs tuning unique to your environment. Scaling challenge number three, neutron scaling. 
As a result of various operational incidents that were protracted because of having certain OpenStack services co-located on the same controller hosts, in 2019, Blizzard migrated Neutron RPC workers to virtual machines to scale horizontally and also solve for shared fate of the API and the worker pool. The Neutron API itself remained on the controller nodes. So by default, Nova queries Neutron every 60 seconds from every compute node to refresh all of its instances networking information then updates the Nova DB with this information. If the cache is not updated, the metadata service and Nova API endpoints will be proxying incorrect data about the instances. At the scale of a thousand computes per availability zone in a region, this load can overwhelm the control plane, even on substantially high spec controller hardware. After much research and conversation in the community, I was excited to extend this interval to between four and five minutes. This reduced load on the control plane from hundreds of thousands of requests per minute by up to 75% during normal operations. Additionally, each Python worker was tuned for eight gigs uh, memory usage just to take account of slow garbage collection. Moving to VMs allowed for sideways scaling on neutron worker pools and solve for shared fate of API and workers. Takeaway here is that neutron configuration and deployment should be carefully considered as the scale of your cloud grows. Scaling challenge number four, compute fleet maintenance. And so while not a scaling challenge directly related to OpenStack itself, this area of concern has challenged us for some time. As our private cloud went into production at scale, there was an internal drive to migrate more workloads into cloud from bare metal. In a lot of cases, this meant migrations took place before applications were truly cloud aware. Over time, this severely impacted our ability to maintain the fleet and target compute host OS and firmware upgrades in a timely manner. Progress involved lots of SRE toil and did not scale. Over the last 15 months, our software team has built a new product, Cloud Automated Maintenance, that enables automated draining and upgrading of our fleet using Ironic underneath to orchestrate bare metal and a public cloud style notification system with automated lifecycle signaling. You can set a golden version of OS and firmware bundles, and the system will cycle through the compute aggregates in each region until everything is compliant. Our goal is to reach a six month cycle time for our global fleet. Takeaway here is onboard tenants to OpenStack with strict expectations set about migration capabilities, particularly for less ephemeral workloads. Also have the processes and or system in place to manage fleet maintenance before entering production. Quick side note, uh, Blizzard Cloud is hiring. We have engineering and leadership positions open in our California office in Irvine and in Texas in Austin. Uh, and yeah, if any of these challenges sound interesting and working at scale on some of the best video games in the world sounds interesting, please hit us up at careers.blizzard.com and search for cloud. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that, that's amazing. Um, a lot of great detail there um, on what you did to, to scale up. And we've gotten some, some great questions here in the chat. So uh, Mohammed Nazer asked, um, I'm curious um, what the control plane split looks like at, on Blizzard clouds. We know RPC runs on separate VMs, but what about the other components, such as database, RabbitMQ, Nova, Etsy, uh, et cetera, <laughs> APIs? Uh, so I'll take that one. So it varies a little bit depending on the region. Some regions are larger, some are smaller, but the, the general split is we have two to five dedicated uh, control nodes for Nova, Neutron, um, Designate, and then uh, uh, Rabbits and MySQL all, uh, both have three to five uh, nodes, again, depending on size. We also have separate nodes for, for Keystone and Glance. So in general, one region of OpenStack uh, or OpenStack deployment would have two two um, nodes of Keystone, two glands uh, would have two to five for Nova, Neutron, Designate, and then like, most of them have three nodes for Rabbit and three for MySQL. But again, we scale that depending on the size. So some of the really large uh, regions might have up to five. Excellent. Um, so we had, a, we had a question from Beth. Uh, how closely are the applications tuned to the environment? You want to take that one, Colin? Or? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, 
tuned to the environment. So, I mean, Beth, just to kind of dig in a little bit more there, you, you're talking about the, the actual underlying, the underlying hardware in a, in a specific region? Uh, it, it's actually tied into what I'm going to be talking about, which is that the, it's, a, it's an environment that you control the applications and you control the underlying OpenStack infrastructure. So how much are they tied together? Yeah, so they're they're pretty they're pretty tightly coupled. Um, uh, as we as we originally deployed cloud, we uh, we had a generation of silicon in the data center, which kind of obviously reflected the year that it went into production. And uh, it's it's not typical to to refresh that right at a at, at maybe the pace that you would be exposed to within a kind of a large cloud service provider or public hyperscaler. So. Um, Things like clock speed, things like the actual like network and uh, storage I/O that 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 you can achieve is actually quite static over time, versus maybe the experience you would have in public cloud, where you can, you know, you can you can deploy uh, new instance types on on new silicon and, and and get those benefits quite quickly. So the applications would um, the performance characteristics for for applications and for data would would have been quite static over time and we get these step increases when when there's a refresh or a, a, a new environment or a new region is is uh is built uh and we then things need to be rebenchmarked um and we work closely with our gaming platform teams during those cycles Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So uh, the, the last question I wanted to ask from uh, from John Garbett, which was um, if your fleet ma maintenance tool uh, has been released openly. Great question. Um, so we, uh, I guess that's TBD. Uh, we've we've had that conversation internally. Um, the the majority of the code base is, is is in Golang, so it's a little bit different than the, um, I guess the the uh, the Python world of of OpenStack. But uh, we do interface with Ironic, as mentioned. Um, some of it is a little specific to the internal tooling within Blizzard and some of the more bespoke internal systems. Um, but uh, as it's nearly code complete, and we're hoping to start onboarding our initial kind of internal customers towards the second half of this year. Um, we're going to put it through, put it through its paces, see, see how, uh, see how it performs and we'll, we'll make a decision on that in the, in the future. So no plans yet. Yeah. I have to add though, that we, we have contributed, contributed back some fixes relating to this. So we, as just an example, we helped fix, uh, uh, the metadata part of cloud in it for ironic, just, you know, so we, we do try to contribute back at the very least, uh, anything that involves directly OpenStack components. Yeah, that's great. And, and if we had more time, I was actually going to ask you about uh, how you move from being a, a, just a, a consumer to more of a contributor. I know that Blizzard does make a lot of contributions. So I think it's, it's very important to point that out, um, doing a lot uh, as a contributor in the community, not just, not just using the software. Um, but unfortunately, we, we're out of time. But uh, I think there's going to be a great event where I uh, invite everyone to continue to um, participate from Blizzard and um, hopefully any questions we didn't get to can be answered in the etherpad added added to, they're being added to the etherpad if you want to jump in there and answer them that would be great